Thank you, Harold, for the invitation to be here and to share your pulpit. And to all of you that invited me back, what an honor and delight and privilege. So much richness of joy and affection is present here in these pews for me, and I see it reflected in your faces. I entitled the message for this morning, Wonderstruck, Sometimes Thunderstruck, by Grace. Now, I thought of using as a text St. John's words, the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, full of grace and truth. But no, that wasn't quite fully right for today. And I thought of, by grace are you saved through faith, what follows after the text read for us a moment ago. I love those words of St. Paul. But I decided to choose my text from the words of H.D.H. H. Showalter. It was on a pastoral call to his house on the hill uh, next to Lewis Streit's house by the old observatory at EMC that I sat talking with him about his life here at Trissel's. And I said, tell me, what have you learned being a part of this congregation in over 80 years? And he paused for a moment and he said, I think what I've learned is to look with my eyes open to see moments of grace, moments when the presence of God is evidenced in the goodness of grace shared among persons. Thank you, I said. I'm going to try and clarify my eyesight so I can see the congregation through the eyes of H.D.H. Showalter. He was a patriarch and grandfather and great-grandfather to many of you here. And he was a spiritual grandfather as well. I thought about it the next week as I was driving out doing pastoral calling here in the valley. As Ed said during the Sunday school, we used to beat the bushes around here learning to know people. In fact, my associate that helped me in this a great deal was a woman named Spide up here at the little, I called it the secondhand smoke cafe, which was just on the side of the road up here beyond the parsonage. Uh, it was a a little place where you could learn to know everything that was going on in the community. And she knew everything that was happening, and she would let me in on who had needs, who was struggling, who was going through some illness, and would open the windows for those uh, experiences for me. And I remember one morning sitting with a cup of coffee in her hand and a cup of coffee in my hand, and I said to her, you know, you're almost an assistant pastor for me. You help me know what's happening that I would miss. And she said, me, a pastor? Yeah, you're doing good work for God in the name of Jesus Christ. I've never done anything in the name of Jesus Christ, she said. Well, would you like to? Yes, I think I would. Well, then just, just slide your coffee cup over, take my hands, and let's pray together. And we prayed together, and she said, Lord Jesus Christ, I don't really know fully who you are, but this man here tells me you can come into my life. And I would love that. And I prayed a blessing on her, and she was born that day. It's gone now, but the smell of smoke is probably there if you walk, walk up there. And, uh, <laughs> and, and it was, well, anyway, that morning I was doing one of the calls back through the valley back here. And out near Brock's Gap, there was a young man who had recently become a believer in Christ. His name was Jennings Seaver, and I'd gone in to talk with Jennings. And we were standing outside next to the barn, and his little one-and-a-half-year-old, maybe a little toddler, is running around us playing at his feet. Little girl, lovely. And we're, we're chatting and we're talking about his new life as a, a participant in the Trissel's congregation and what's going on for him. And suddenly, one of us notes that right three feet over from his feet, Right where the little girl is dashing by is a coiled copperhead. And its little eyes are watching as the little girl's legs go by. But it is not struck. And I point at that, and he looks at it. He grabs his daughter. She comes by, and he steps backward. And we look at the snake as it's still there. And then suddenly he whips around, and he looks on both sides of himself. And he spins, and he looks, and I said, what are you doing, Jennings? He said, I've always heard that they're guardian angels, and I was hoping I'd get to see one because I know there's one here. And I said, look, we don't know if there's a guardian angel here, but we know that God is here. God is here with us. 
The next week I went back to H.J. Showwater and said, is this, is this one of those things you talk about? Oh yeah, and he said, and there are many, many, many more. Kind of opened a, a little window on, on how he saw things with his eyes. You know, I decided, uh, becoming a pastor here, that the care of souls, the care of souls was the primary function that I had to do here. I mean, I could run the church program along with everyone else, but how do we care for the souls of people? So I arranged to meet with all of the uh, adults on their birthday and give a kind of spiritual reflection on how they were doing in, in this business of following Jesus. I remember the surprise that people had when I came to meet them. Like Mary Zach Turner said, nobody's ever asked me about the welfare of my soul before. She's been in this church for a long, long time, but no one ever said, Mary, how's it going for you, you see? And Catherine Schenk, she said, this is a totally new experience for me. I know people would come and talk to Sam, but I don't know that anyone's ever said to me, what's happening in your life? And where are you? After your mom, yeah. Uh, there were people that talked about their souls, their experience in their life. And I, I began to say, there are lots of windows of grace here that I might have missed if I had not been watching carefully. And I remember that Simone Weil, the great uh, uh, French writer, philosopher, said, the love of our neighbor in all its fullness simply means being able to say, what are you going through? And that's what I did. I went from person to person to say, what are you going through? And they taught me. Like you teach Harold. We're all here as interns while you are our instructors, you know. And those were rich times for me. I began to wonder, how would I define grace? Well, it's taken me some years to find definitions for grace that I like, so I'm gonna share three of them. Number one, the first definition of grace that really rang true in my heart was, grace is God's indefatigable acceptance that is greater than our capacity to mess things up. Did you get that? Grace is God's indefatigable. You don't use that word, do you? Yeah. <laughs> It means untiring, of course, and, and it's acceptance that's greater than any capacity we have to mess things up. I had left Trestles and moved west to teach at the Associated Mennonite Seminaries in Elkhart. I came out of faculty meeting, and as I'm heading down, I have a class starting at 3 o'clock, and the, the faculty meeting has just ended, and as I pass, I, I open the little box for our mail, and there's a pink slip. Someone, an old friend from Virginia has just called. I wonder, what could that be about? I have six minutes till class. My office is around the corner. I dart in and I dial the number. And he's there. And I say, it's David. You just called a little bit ago. Is something happening? Tell me what's going on for you. What are you going through? <laughs> Quoting Simone Weil. And he said, well, I'm doing fine, but I heard that you're having difficulty. You can't see, right? I said, yeah, I had uh, two cataract surgeries and then two detached retinas and then a vitrectomy where they changed the, the liquid in your eye. But actually, I'm, I'm seeing a bit better now and I'm doing all right. Tell me about you. And he said, well, I want to talk about things he did. And I said, you know, I've got a class in two minutes. I need to run. But is there anything more that you called about? He said, oh, yeah, my daughter, my daughter is getting married. She's been through a really painful divorce. And she's, she's getting married this Saturday. And I had to talk to somebody and just tell them that that was the case. And I said, you know, I'd love to talk more. And I really care what you're going through. And I think over the miles from Indiana to Virginia, God is with you, with me. Let's lift each other up into the hands of Jesus and say, make this day for her a day of renewal and delight and discovery and joy. And may it be true for you too. And I can feel that he's dragging his feet. It's hard for him to see this happening with his own values, whatever they are. The next day I'm down in Southern Indiana at Ball State University doing some lectures. And as I'm driving home, the whole way I discover, I'm still carrying on that phone conversation in my head, you know? And so when I get home and walk into the house, I go to the phone and I have his number in the pink slip there with my stuff in my briefcase. I pull it out and I dial his number and he's there. And I say, hey, you got a paper and pencil? It's David. Yeah, I've got a paper and pencil. He said, just a minute. 
And uh, he comes back, he said, okay. I said, I have something for you to write down. Oh, really? I could have figured that out, he said, when you asked for a pencil. And I said, write this, grace. Grace? Yeah, grace. Grace is God's indefatigable. Indefatigable. Yeah, yeah, it means, I know what it means, he said. It's just a crazy word, I don't use that word. Indefatigable acceptance that is greater than our capacity to mess things up. And then we're quiet. And then he said, you're giving me that for Saturday, aren't you? And I said, yes, I am. And then I can hear that he's crying. And on my end of the phone, I'm crying. And I say, I love you. And he says, I love you too. And we hang up. It's when grace untiring gets into your soul that you begin to know what that stuff is really about, you know? Easter Sunday, communion service here in this church. The whole congregation, or a good part of it, is on edge. Because two brothers in the congregation had fallen into differences over about $7,000, which in the 60s was real money. And they'd come into communion service that morning. One was seated over that side, and the other with his wife was seated over that side. We knew that a mediating group had met with them and tried to make peace with this, and they had gotten some distance, but there were still deep feelings that couldn't be quite resolved in the mediation that was done. And we wondered what will happen. And then they brought the tubs down the aisle and set one right there, one right over here, put the towels on the, on the bench. We were going to have feet washing. And before anything could begin, I think it was Sam Shank that jumped up. And he waved at the man over there. It was Robert Alger. And Robert Alger waved at him. And they met right here. And they went over there and sat down. And they washed each other's feet. And they got up and they hugged each other and they kissed. And I thought, now, HDA would, HGH would consider that a moment of real grace. Because when they went back to their seats, it was like the whole atmosphere had changed in a foot washing service. Yeah, Cho Shank called me. He said, David, I'm, I'm, I'm really scared. He said, I have this employee. His name is Denver Haldeman. He lives across the road in a trailer, his wife and took the kids and is gone. And when I were to call him, he, he just wove his, waved his rifle at me outside the door and then shut the door and went back inside. Um, it's down at the corner here where Crystal's Road joins 42. I'll be there, I said. So I drove over and I knew Joe was up on his porch praying for me. And uh, I took a deep breath and walked down the path to the trailer down there and rapped on the door and then sort of stepped to the side, not sure quite what was going to happen. And the door opened and there was Denver with his rifle. I knew him. We had visited before. And I said, can I come in? Joe said, you're going through a really hard time. Any chance we could talk? Come on in, he said. He sat down on the sofa, cradling the rifle. I pulled a chair up close. I said, Denver, you got a hard time right now, what the British call a sticky wicket. And it's the kind of thing that tests and brings out the best in each of us and we find the right direction to go. What you gonna do? And we talked, and we talked. And then finally I said, do you mind? God is present here with us. Can we say a word to God? It's okay, he said. And we prayed, the rifle still across his knees, and then when we finished the prayer, he got up and he said, I'll be back in a minute. And he went out the door. And I heard a sound of chopping, real chopping. And he came back in holding a piece of the rifle. And he said, well, I don't think that rifle is ever going to be used anymore. That could have been the end of my life, the end of my wife's life, the end of maybe all our future. And it won't be. He said, hey, can I have that piece? And he gave it to me. I'd like to have that. I think it's still, still somewhere in California. And I said, look, just stay here. Let me find her and go talk with her. 
Maybe we can begin finding what it is that's felt so painful to her that she needed to leave you. And let's see if we can't work through that because it's not all over just because you have a change in your heart. It's got to be something that makes peace between the two of you. And I, I thought, I'd like to tell HDH that story. He would call that a moment of grace, I think. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh, I have the ones about being called in by J. Ward Shank over the wedding band, so you don't need to hear that. Uh, uh, but we did find our way through that because I had a really good counselor. I had Ward Shank as the district bishop. I had Lyndon Wanger as the go-between. But I soon discovered that I had a bishop that could guide me, who'd had years of international experience in Egypt and and the savvy of knowing how people related and knowing the congregation. And Miriam, a show order, became my functional bishop. I would phone her or go to see her and say, here are the problems I'm facing in the congregation. Could you, could you give me some insight into this? And she would sit back and say, well, David, it all begins here and here and here and here and here. Let's sort it out. She was probably the best bishop I've ever worked with. Uh, that was the day when, I don't know if even women were allowed up here behind the pulpit, but she was here behind the pulpit in her own way. You know, this was a congregation with a lot of investment in doing good and doing things, doing things well. And when Ed Bontrager came as the associate minister here, he was a really creative young preacher. He had these sermons he was working on a homiletics class that were particularly polished. And one Sunday he preached a sermon on the benefits and blessings of jealousy. Now, what he did was, he turned everything all around. He said, when you are jealous of somebody, it's a sign that you admire that person and you wish for what you see in them. It's a sign that you are wishing to turn that admiration into an affirmation of how good they are and of how well they're doing. And you want to put yourself in the shadow of that and say, let me learn from that. And so there are benefits and blessings to jealousy. And there's a lot of that seeing each other doing well here in this congregation. And you should have the joy and the fun of being jealous. So let me recommend ways you could go about being creatively jealous. And he preached this semi-ironic, almost, almost sarcastic, uh, sardonic, I guess would be the proper word for it, sardonic sermon that was really the gospel. And you know, for weeks afterward, people would talk to me and they'd say, you know, there's been a competition between the Timothy Showwater family and the HDH Showwater family for a long, long time, and it's kind of hidden and so forth. But as Ed says, it's all right to be jealous, but let's turn that away from competitiveness and uh, finding new discovery of, of how we admire each other and how we can work to each other. I, I heard your sermon quoted more, Ed, um, than I think any sermon preached here. You, you, you probably don't have those notes anymore. I don't know if I'm quoting you accurately. Am I close? I don't remember. He doesn't remember. <laughs> well, I'll tell you, the man could preach, and, we, and he, did, he did a really, really creative job, and I was delighted with that. <laughs> um, you know, during that time, grace enabled us to differ and yet work together, which is so important. And what you were doing, Ed, was helping open those doors for doing that better. Because this was a difficult time. It was the 60s. It was the time of Kent State. It was the time of President Kennedy's assassination. Oh, I remember the shock of that driving on 259 between two pastoral calls and just turning the car right around and coming back home because I wanted to see what was going on in Dallas. Um, it was a time of, of all sorts of upset in the nation as a whole. And the heart of it all was what was happening in Vietnam. And since I had become the speaker of the Midnight Hour in 1966, I had wanted very much to speak about these issues and relate the Sermon on the Mount to what we should be saying as a Mennonite people with Anabaptist values in a world that was tearing itself apart. But that just wasn't done. Charlie never did that, Charlie Hostetter on the Mennonite Hour. And when we insisted there should be messages on peacemaking and understanding that our nationality is Christian and not American, why well, we got a guest speaker, John Howard Yoder, came on the uh, broadcast to speak those messages, but, but Charles wouldn't do that. And so when I became the speaker, started in September, October I had a series, and then when I planned the Christmas series, 
I did a series on what does it mean if the Prince of Peace is really the Prince of Peace in your, your church, in your community, in your nation. And they were kind of gutsy sermons, um, typical of a young squirt who's trying to find a way to, to get the gospel out there in a, in a way that reflects on Anabaptism. And I finished them, recorded them, feeling that this, this is going to be a, a good series, and flew off to Berlin for the World Congress on Evangelism. I arrived home at the end of the Congress and came back to the parsonage, and there was a note saying, I know you've just come in from an overnight air, airline flight, but go straight to the studio. The scripts are waiting for you, and you must re-record the, the December messages, and you need to, you need to go uh, there immediately, and the, the people will be working on them during the night, putting them together. The audition committee will listen to them Sunday morning before church, and then we will be able to mail them out by special delivery because we're late, because you've been away. And I said, what? They've rewritten my sermons? They've never done anything like that to anyone in, in the midnight hour. So I drove down there and looked at the texts, and my good friend Jim Fairfield had been asked to rewrite my sermons and turn it away from peacemaking and peace advocacy and peace witness to kind of a Fulton J. Sheen, peace with God and peace in your heart. I sat there and I, I was just broken. What could I do? And I called Ken Weaver. I think I called Lewis Streit. Yeah, Lewis, of course, was chairman of the board and a member of our congregation here. And they said, well, the auditioning committee refused to accept the sermons. This has never been done before like this in the Mennonite Hour. And I know you're new. I know you're young. But you shouldn't be doing this quite this way. And I said, all right, I'll re-record them on one condition. Can I meet with the whole committee of the Mennonite Hour to talk about why we cannot be proclaiming what is the statement of faith, confession of faith, for the Mennonite Church when we bear witness to what the Sermon on the Mount means to us in our life? Louis said, that makes sense to me. I'll back you up on that. I recorded the sermons. I did the best job I could being tired and half asleep, drove home, and they went out to the, broad, to the stations, of course, they, you know, on Monday morning. And on January, I was able to meet with the committee and spell out why I thought it was really important to share the, the gospel, the whole gospel, a gospel of peace as well as a gospel of personal transformation. And uh, members of the committee stood behind me and backed me up. And, uh, you know, during that whole time then, the months that followed where I spoke once a week, once a month, rather, on, uh, on, on peacemaking during the Vietnam War. Uh, and religious stations, the conservative ones, would, would, would cut me off and, and refuse the program and then, and then cancel the Mennonite Hour. And we went through a lot of difficulties during some of that time. Tristel's Church, maybe, maybe it's because Norman Durstein had helped prepare you for backing the Mennonite Hour, and you felt like it was part of the witness of the congregation. But Tristel's Church stood by me. And they were, they were there for me. And I was so grateful because that whole time, all the way through the 60s and into the early 70s, when things were really, really tragic in Vietnam, uh, we could witness to that. Not everybody in the church did, of course. I remember a man by the name of Shank, somewhere to the north, a Mennonite minister, wrote and said, I just heard your sermon this morning. And at the end, I immediately got my checkbook and wrote a $50 check and sent it to the re-elect Richard Nixon committee. So I knew that there were people that disagreed with me. <laughs> and it was, uh, it was quite all right. But what I wanted was to make sure that I was bearing witness to what we believe and what we taught as a Mennonite church. And I was convinced in that whole time that grace is God's indefatigable acceptance that is greater than our capacity to mess things up. Yeah. Then I found a second definition of grace that I thought really rang true to life. It came from a man that later I would, I would take over his office at Fuller Seminary. But it was an early reading of Lewis Smedes, the ethicist that taught at Fuller, where I went later on, so much later on in life. Lewis Smedes said that grace is that moment when in Christ you discover that your past is not going to catch up with you. Did you get that? Grace is that moment when you discover that in Christ, your past is not going to catch up with you. That's you. Your past is never going to catch up with you when grace is discovered with inside you. And I thought about that. 
You know, it was after a men's meeting over here that we were sitting around talking over coffee and, and Narvel Trumbo, I don't know if you ever saw Narvel Trumbo do, those of you who remember him well, do his impressions. He was capable of doing really remarkable impressions. And he started doing an impression of the preaching of Hop Turner, the famous uh, old preacher from a generation before. I never heard him preach, but I heard stories of him. And Norville took on his voice and his mannerisms and his tone of voice. And he had Sam Shank correcting him when he got a line wrong or, or someone else. And he said, the arrogance of man that they built this giant ship called the Titanic that no man in the world could sink. And they sailed it across the sea with all the wealthy people that they could find to fill that full and celebrate that they had conquered the seas and the oceans. But he had his tone of voice that I can't do for you. You know, I can do W.C. Fields, but I couldn't do Hop Turner because I never heard of Hop Turner. Anyway, as he, as he finished this up, he said, then God with the long arm reached up into the Arctic and seized this giant, giant iceberg and pulled it down there and the two met. And anyway, Hop Turner must have been an amazing preacher. They say he had seven sermons and you would give him a text and he would do the text and then he would do a segue into his chosen sermon for that day, <laughs> one of his seven sermons. And that he polished those sermons, whatever work he did. And so they were eloquent and beautiful. And I, I don't know if anyone ever has anybody write one down. I wish I could. Anyway, he told all that. And then as we're going out, Neil Turner says, you know, Hop Turner has a son, lives up the mountain on the road up uh, along Little North Mountain over here. He dropped out of the church when he was a teenager, had nothing to do with his father. And he still lives over there, Jim Turner. Uh -huh. Hey, can you tell me which house? I'd like to meet him. I'd like to hear how he experienced growing up as a PK, a preacher's kid, with Hop Turner, the preacher, as his father. And Neil said, sure, I'll point it out to you. So I knocked on the door. And I told him I came from over at Trissels. Well, I know Trissels, he said. Yeah, that's one of the, one of the churches I don't go to. <laughs> and, and so I went inside, and we, we began to talk. And he told me his history. He told me about his dad. He told me about getting fed up with a Mennonite church and how he got rid of it. And he said what was liberating to me as I got to reading Tom Paine, the early American philosopher, and I knew that there was no God, and that my father was wrong. There was no long arm to reach up to the... <laughs> to the icebergs, none of that stuff, you see. And he talked about all of that, and I said, you're an interesting person to visit, and I want, I want to come back again. Can we talk more? And we talked more, and we built a friendship. And over the year that followed, he began to say, I really miss the conversations that I never could have with my dad. Now I can have them with you, but it's unfinished stuff that we never got put into words between us. And then he grew ill. And he was taken to Rockingham Memorial Hospital to intensive care. In the waiting room outside, siblings and a couple other family members were waiting. I could see when I talked to them that they felt like he's going to finally have to face everything he did to us, dumping his wife, his kids, finding another woman, living in common law marriage up here, and, and what a guy, you know. And I said, well, he's, he's on the way toward maybe a better ending than what it's been for a while. Oh, I don't think so. I went inside, they let me in, and I sat by his bed. I was there for three hours, holding his hand and just quiet. He was clear as he was dying, as they told me. And when he looked at me and he said, you really think that God can accept me? We had talked about that a number of times, but now he wanted one more reassurance. And I was trying to say to him, although I hadn't heard Lou Smead's line yet, any yet, that grace, you see, is the moment when you discover that in Christ, your past is not going to catch up with you. And he died squeezing my hand like he was holding on to the hand of Jesus. And I think he was, you see. Uh, I had been to Washington, D.C. for one of our broadcasting uh, meetings that we attended and came home on a Saturday night after the meetings to get ready for church the next morning here. And I walked in the door over here, and there was a note for me, as is often the case, and the note was from C.C. Turner. Now, you understand, C.C. Turner was sort of the, the prize person that 
every preacher evangelist wanted to try and reach because he was one of the most brilliant men in the community, did this amazing shepherding and caring for the horses, uh, was eloquent as can be, and had been in the lot for the ministry several times in the Northern District, but he had left the church behind long ago. And I wanted to know C.C. Turner, and I had gone to meet him sometime, and we built, built a friendship, and we went golfing together, and how he would laugh when I would slice or hook, and, uh, and he would send a true shot right down to the green. Um, we had great conversations, and uh, he and I and Mildred would have conversations, and I learned to love C.C. Turner. You know, he was really fascinating. He would quote a line from Shakespeare, and I would say, that's really great. And the, the next one is, and then I would quote Shakespeare. And then he would quote Shakespeare right on, and we would go back. And then that was nothing, because one day we were started on the Book of Romans, and he knew virtually all of the Book of Romans by memory. I mean, he was, he was incredibly knowledgeable, but he had nothing to do with the church. The phone message that I picked up said, C.C. Turner called. Mildred just died. I drove over to C.C. Turner's house. It was, it was raining. I was still in my suit from the trip to D.C. Thin leather shoes. Walked in through the rain quickly to the door, hoping to get inside. Found that the back room was full of family and friends who had come to be with him. He's sitting on the far side. He sees me and he says, go on out. And he gets up and moves through the crowd, comes on out, grabs his coat, and he says, I can't take it in there anymore. I need to walk. Let's go. And so he and I walk out the driveway, down to the corner, down across through the next way to the next corner, and across, around the block, until we come back to the house. I'm kind of soaked to the skin. He's doing fine with his coat. We walk. Now and then I squeeze his arm. But for all of my seminary training and all of my wisdom, I thought, I couldn't think of anything to say. Mildred had died, and I knew the tension there and his long relationship with a, another woman that had become the mother to two wonderful kids later, I would learn to know, beautiful kids. I knew there were lots of things in that whole story. I couldn't think of anything to say. And we finished the walk and we stood back there and I thought, now as a pastor, I should have just the right word, right? I didn't have it. All I could do was squeeze his arm. And then Cece said, David, I've been outside for a long, long time. I think it's time for me to come back in. I knew what he meant. And I just squeezed his arm. And he went on into the house. And in my sopping clothes, I got in my car and drove back home here to the parsonage. And on the way home, I felt an utter, total failure. What kind of pastor can't think of a word to say that he's afraid it'll be? His foot in his mouth, and so he just shuts up and walks. Of course, now that I have a PhD in pastoral care and counseling and psychotherapy, I look back at that and say, I didn't know it, but it was probably the best pastoral care I ever gave. Yeah. Yeah. All he wanted that night was presence and someone that cared about him. And when he and his family came and sat here and we had baptisms, and then he moved on to find Zion as a setting that was also nourishing for him. What a lovely man. My stories are running long, so let's move on to the third definition. Grace is also something amazing. Oh, yeah, hey, there's good stories we're missing here, but you know that's all right. Um, grace is, is so much, we must describe it as a gift. It's a gift that comes to us totally surprising. Uh, two weeks ago, uh, maybe three, one of the great Christian writers of our time, Frederick Buechner. Have you read Frederick Buechner? Alphabet of Grace, a whole series of books. If you haven't, look for them in the U.S. bookstore somewhere. Frederick Buechner, B-U-E-C-H-N-E-R. He's a wonderful writer. And you'll read a line, you'll say, I wish I had said that. You know, that's just so good. Anyway, his little book, Alphabet of Grace, describes how grace is a gift. 
And I just want you to hear this. He says, grace is something you can never get, but can only be given. There's no way to earn it, no way to deserve it, no way to bring it about any more than you can deserve the taste of raspberries and cream or earn good looks or bring about your own birth. A good sleep is grace, and so are good dreams. Most tears are grace. The smell of rain is grace. Somebody loving you is grace. Loving somebody is grace. Have you ever tried to tried to love somebody? No, it's grace. It's a joyful gift. The grace of God means something like, here's your life. You might never have been, but you are because the party wouldn't have been complete without you. Here is the world. Beautiful and terrible things will happen. Don't be afraid. I'm with you. Nothing can ever separate us. It's for you that I created the universe, and I love you. That's grace. There's only one catch. Like any other gift, the gift of grace can be yours only if you reach out and take it. And maybe being able to reach out and take it is a gift called grace, too. Isn't that powerful? Grace is a gift. God's indefatigable love that you can't mess up, no matter how hard you try. The discovery that in Christ, your past will never catch you because there's a gift. HDH was right. He was so right. And I saw the evidence, the proof of all that right here, right here in this circle. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, our parent, and the koinonia and fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all. Amen.